word uh, terror is one that uh, rightly arouses strong emotions and deep concerns. The primary concern, naturally, should be to take measures to alleviate the threat. Uh, it has been severe in the past, and it's likely that it will be even more so in the future. Uh, to proceed with this in some serious way, uh, we should have establish a few guidelines. Uh, here are several simple ones. Uh, the first is that facts matter, uh, even if we don't happen to like them. Uh, the second is that uh, elementary moral principles matter, uh, even if they have consequences that we would prefer not to face. And the third is that relative clarity matters. So it's pointless to uh, uh, seek uh, a truly precise definition of terror, or for that matter of any other concept outside of the hard sciences and mathematics, and often not even there. Uh, but we should seek enough clarity, uh, at least, to be able to distinguish terror from two notions that lie uneasily at its borders, uh, aggression at one end and uh, legitimate resistance at the other. Terror finds its place somewhere between those two. Uh, well, if we accept these guidelines, there are actually quite constructive ways to deal with the problem of terrorism, uh, which are, again, quite severe. Uh, it's commonly claimed that uh, critics of ongoing policies do not present solutions. If you check the record, I think you'll find something else. Uh, you'll find that there's an accurate translation of that charge, and namely they do present solutions, uh, very constructive ones, but I don't like them. Uh, so therefore they don't present solutions. Uh, suppose then that we accept these simple guidelines and now turn to the war on terror. Well, since we've agreed that facts matter, uh, it matters that the war on terror uh, was not declared by George W. Bush on 9-11, but by the Reagan administration uh, 20 years earlier. Uh, they came into office declaring that their foreign policy would confront what the president called the evil scourge of terrorism, a plague spread by depraved opponents of civilization itself, in a return to barbarism in the modern age. It's the Secretary of State. Uh, the campaign was uh, directed against uh, a particularly vi virulent form of the plague, uh, state-directed international terrorism. Uh, the main focus of the war on terror was Central America and the Middle East, uh, but it reached uh, Southern Africa, uh, Southeast Asia, and beyond. Uh, a second fact is that the war was declared and implemented by pretty much the same people who are conducting the redeclared war on terrorism. The civilian component of the redeclared war on terror is led by John Negroponte, who was appointed last year to supervise all counter-terror operations. I'll return to some of his tasks during the first phase of the war. The military component of the redeclared war on terror is led by Donald Rumsfeld. Uh, during the first phase of the war on terror, Rumsfeld was uh, Reagan, President Reagan's special representative to the Middle East, and there his main task was to establish close relations with Saddam Hussein so that the United States could provide him with large-scale aid, including means to develop weapons of mass destruction uh, all of this continuing long after the huge atrocities against the Kurds and after the end of the war with Iran. Uh, the official purpose of the continuing aid was not concealed. Uh, it was, as President Bush number one put it, it was Washington's responsibility to aid American exporters and also, I'm quoting now, the strikingly unanimous view of Washington and its allies, Britain and Saudi Arabia, that whatever the sins of the Iraqi leader, he offered the West and the region a better hope for his country's stability than did those who have suffered his repression. 
Now that's the New York Times Middle East correspondent describing Washington's judgment as George Bush number one uh, authorized Saddam to crush the Shiite rebellion in 1991, which probably would have overthrown the tyrant, uh, this case leaving tens of thousands of corpses. Uh, Saddam is at last on trial for his crimes. The first trial, which is now underway, is for crimes that he committed in 1982. Uh, 1982 happens to be an important year in U.S.-Iraq relations. It was in 1982 that Reagan removed Iraq from the list of states supporting terror. Uh, so the reason was so that aid could flow to his friend in Baghdad. Uh, Rumsfeld then visited Baghdad to confirm the arrangements. Uh, judging by uh, media and journals of opinion, it would be impolite to mention any of these facts, so I beg your pardon, uh, let alone to suggest that some others might be standing alongside Saddam before the bar of justice. Uh, removing uh, Iraq, Saddam, from the list of states supporting terrorism left a gap. Uh, that gap was at once filled by Cuba, uh, perhaps in recognition of the fact that the U.S. terrorist wars against Cuba from 1961 had just peaked at that time, including events that would be on the front pages right now in societies that valued their freedom. I'll return briefly to some of them. Uh, since the first war on terror was waged by those who are now carrying out the redeclared war or their immediate mentors, it follows that anyone who's seriously interested in the redeclared war on terror uh, should ask at once how it was carried out in the 1980s. Uh, that topic, however, is under a virtual ban, and that becomes understandable as soon as we investigate the facts. Uh, the first war on terror very quickly became a murderous and brutal terrorist war in every corner of the world where it reached, uh, leaving traumatized societies that may never recover. Uh, what happened is hardly obscure, but it's doctrinally unacceptable, and therefore it's protected from inspection. Uh, unearthing the record, which is not very difficult, is an enlightening exercise uh, with enormous implications for the future. Well, these are a few of the relevant facts. Uh, let's turn to the second of the guidelines, uh, elementary moral principles. Uh, the most elementary, so elementary that I'm embarrassed to mention it, is a virtual truism. Uh, decent people apply to themselves the same standards that they apply to others, in fact, more stringent ones. Uh, adherence to this principle of universality would have many useful consequences. Uh, for one thing, it would save a lot of forests. The principle would radically reduce published reports and commentary on social and political affairs. It would virtually eliminate the newly fashionable discipline of just war theory. It would wipe the, sl the slate almost clean with regard to the war on terror. Uh, and the reason is the same in all cases, many others, too. The principle of universality is rejected, uh, for the most part, tacitly, sometimes explicitly. Uh, these are very sweeping statements, and I'm purposely putting them in a stark form uh, to invite you to challenge them, and I hope that you do so. Uh, you'll find, I think, that although the statements are very slightly overdrawn on purpose, uh, they nevertheless are uncomfortably true to, close to accurate, and in fact very fully documented. But try for yourselves and see. Actually, here's another one you might try uh, from the front pages, in England at least. Uh, in England, uh, the principle of universality would terminate uh, virtually all media and publishers in England under Tony Blair's proposed Blair's proposed. Uh, glorification of Terror Act, uh, which actually was voted down by the Lords, uh, who proposed instead a ban on indirect encouragement of terror. Uh, well, uh, that, uh, I repeat, that 
a law which will be passed in one or another form will shut down uh, virtually every publisher and uh, uh, journal in England. Uh, does this statement sound extreme? Uh, well, not if facts matter. Uh, if they do, then the statement is in fact quite conservative and therefore regarded as outrageous by the educated classes. Uh, 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 and uh, the two proposals would have rather similar consequences. Again, I urge you just to think it through and look at the facts. Uh, this uh, most elementary of moral truisms is sometimes uh, upheld, uh, at least in words. Uh, one example of critical importance today is the Nuremberg Tribunal, which sentenced uh, Nazi criminals. Uh, in sentencing them to death, the uh, Justice Robert, Robert Jackson, who is the chief of counsel for the prosecution, for the, for the United States uh, and the tribunal, uh, he spoke uh, eloquently and memorably on the principle of universality. 1945, here's what he said. If certain acts of violation of treaties are crimes, they are crimes whether the United States does them or whether Germany does them. And we are not prepared to lay down a rule of criminal conduct against others, which we would not be willing to have invoked against us. We must never forget that the record on which we judge these defendants is the record on which history will judge us tomorrow. To pass these defendants a poisoned chalice is to put it to our own lips as well. That's a clear and honorable statement of the principle of universality. Uh, but the judgment at Nuremberg, which had just concluded, crucially violated that principle, consciously and explicitly. The tribunal had the task of defining war crime and crimes against humanity. Uh, it crafted these definitions very carefully so that crimes uh, are criminal uh, only if they were not committed by the Allies. Uh, so urban uh, bombing of civilian concentrations uh, was excluded from the tribunal because the Allies carried it out uh, more barbarically than the Nazis. And uh, Nazi war criminals, like Admiral Dönitz, submarine, head of the submarine fleet, uh, he was able to plead successfully uh, that uh, the, their, his British and U.S. counterparts uh, had uh, uh, carried out the same practices, so therefore he was exonerated of those charges. Uh, the reasoning was outlined by Telford Taylor. He's a distinguished international lawyer an historian who was Jackson's chief counsel for war crimes. Uh, he explained, in his words, that to punish the foe, especially the vanquished foe, for conduct in which the enforcing nation has engaged would be so grossly inequitable as to discredit the laws themselves. And that's quite correct. But the operative definition of crime uh, also discredits the laws themselves and subsequent tribunals are discredited by the same moral flaw, uh, but the self-exemption of the powerful from uh, international law and elementary moral principles uh, bars any discussion of these unwelcome truisms. Well, let's turn to the third background issue, the defining terror and distinguishing it from aggression and legitimate resistance. Actually, I've been writing about terror for 25 years, uh, ever since the Reagan administration came into office declaring its war on terror. And I've been using definitions that seem doubly appropriate. Uh, first of all, they make sense. And secondly, the, they are the official definitions of those who are waging the war. So to take one of these official definitions, uh, terrorism is the calculated use of violence or threat of violence to attain goals that are political, religious, or ideological in nature through intimidation, coercion, or instilling fear, typically targeting civilians. Uh, the British government's definition is about the same. Uh, terrorism is the use or threat of action which is violent, damaging, or disrupting and is intended to influence the government or intimidate the public uh, 
uh, and is for the purpose of advancing a political, religious, or ideological cause. Uh, these definitions seem fairly clear, uh, pretty close to ordinary usage, and there also seems to be general agreement that they are appropriate when discussing the terrorism of enemies. But a problem arises at once. Uh, these definitions yield an entirely unacceptable consequence. It follows that the United States is a leading terrorist state, and the same is true of uh, what's been called the spear carrier for Pax Americana. It's referring to Tony Blair's Britain and Britain's leading journal of international affairs. Uh, this was true dramatically during the Reaganite war on terror. Uh, just to take the most uncontroversial case, uh, Reagan's state-directed terrorist war against Nicaragua was condemned by the World Court backed by two Security Council resolutions, both vetoed by the United States, uh, with Britain uh, politely abstaining. Another completely clear case is Cuba, since 1961, where the record by now is voluminous and not controversial, and there's a long list beyond them. Uh, however, we may ask a question about these terrorist crimes. Uh, we may ask, uh, for example, whether the state-directed terror against Nicaragua was really terrorism or whether it rises to the level of the much higher crime of aggression. Uh, the concept of aggression was defined clearly enough by Justice Jackson at Nuremberg in terms that were basically reiterated by, uh, in an authoritative General Assembly resolution with no objections. Uh, an aggressor, Jackson proposed to the tribunal, is a state that is the first to commit such actions as invasion of its armed forces with or without a declaration of war of the territory of another state, or provision of support to armed bands formed in the territory of another state, or refusal, notwithstanding the request of the invaded state, to take in its own territory all the measures in its power to deprive those bands of all assistance or protection. Well, the first of those provisions unambiguously applies to the U.S.-British invasion of Iraq, and the second, just as clearly, applies to the U.S. war against Nicaragua, uh, which means that the Nuremberg judgment is appropriate. Uh, however, we might give the current incumbents in Washington and their uh, European allies uh, the benefit of the doubt, uh, considering them guilty only of the lesser crime of international terrorism on a huge and unprecedented scale. Uh, the World Court, uh, interestingly, did not condemn the Reagan administration for aggression in the Nicaragua case. And the reasons are instructive and of quite considerable contemporary relevance. Uh, Nicaragua's case at the World Court was presented by the distinguished Harvard University law professor, uh, Abram Chase, former legal advisor to the State Department. Uh, the court, however, rejected a large part of his case uh, on the grounds that when the United States accepted the jurisdiction of the World Court in 1946, uh, it did so only after entering a reservation excluding itself from prosecution under multilateral treaties, including the UN Charter. Uh, so therefore, it's barred from prosecution for aggression. Uh, the court accepted that and therefore restricted its deliberations to customary international law and a bilateral U.S.-Nicaragua treaty so that the more serious charges were excluded. And even on these very narrow grounds, uh, the court did charge Washington with uh, unlawful use of force, that's in lay language, international terrorism, and uh, ordered it to terminate the crimes and pay substantial reparations. Uh, the Reagan administration reacted by escalating the war with bipartisan support. Uh, after the shattered country fell back under U.S. control, it declined to further misery. It's now the second poorest country in Latin America after Haiti, and by accident, also second after Haiti, 
in intensity of U.S. intervention in the past century. Uh, the standard way to lament these tragedies is to say that Haiti and Nicaragua are battered by storms of their own making. I'm quoting the Boston Globe, which is at the liberal extreme of uh, American journalism. Uh, Guatemala ranks third, which is at the liberal extreme of uh, American journalism. Uh, Guatemala ranks third in both misery and U.S. intervention, uh, another one of those curious aberrations that uh, litter history, uh, all placed on the index for obvious reasons. Uh, these uh, considerations have to do with the boundary between terror and aggression. Uh, what about the boundary between terror and resistance, legitimate resistance? Uh, one question that arises is the legitimacy of actions, I'm now quoting, the legitimacy of actions to realize the right to self-determination, freedom, and independence as derived from the Charter of the United Nations of people forcibly deprived of that right, particularly peoples under colonial and racist regimes and foreign occupation. Uh, do such actions fall under terror or resistance? Well, the quoted words are from the most forceful denunciation of the crime of terrorism by the UN General Assembly. That was in December 1987. Uh, it was taken up under Reaganite pressure, hence it's obviously an important resolution. It's even more important because of the near unanimity of support for it. Uh, the resolution passed 153 to 2, uh, with one country, Honduras, abstaining. Uh, the resolution stated that nothing in the present resolution could in any way prejudice the right to self-determination, freedom, and independence as characterized in the words I just quoted. Well, the two countries that voted against the resolution explained their reasons at the UN session. The reasons were based on the paragraph that I just quoted. The phrase colonial and racist regimes was understood to refer to their ally, apartheid South Africa, uh, which was then consummating its horrendous massacres in the neighboring countries and continuing its brutal repression within. And evidently, the United States and Israel, the two countries that voted against, uh, could not condone resistance to the apartheid regime, uh, particularly when the resistance was led by Nelson Mandela's African National Congress, which is, was one of the world's more notorious terrorist groups as Washington determined at the same time. Uh, granting legitimacy against foreign occupation was also unacceptable. The phrase was understood to refer to Israel's US-backed military occupation then in its 20th year. And evidently, resistance to that occupation could not be condoned either. Uh, even though at the time of the resolution, uh, resistance scarcely existed uh, despite extensive torture, uh, degradation, uh, brutality, uh, robbery of land and resources, and other familiar concomitants of military occupation, uh, Palestinians still remained uh, what they called samidin, uh, those who quietly endure. Uh, well, technically, there are no vetoes at the General Assembly, uh, but in the real world, a negative U.S. vote is a veto. In fact, it's a double veto. The resolution is not implemented, and it's vetoed from reporting and from history, as happened in this case. Uh, it should be added that the voting pattern is quite common at the General Assembly and also at the Security Council on a very wide range of issues. Uh, ever since the mid-1960s, when the world fell pretty much out of control after decolonization, uh, the United States is far in the lead in Security Council vetoes its spear carrier is second, and uh, no one else comes even close. It's also of some interest to note that a majority of the American public favors abandonment of the veto and following the will of the majority, even if Washington disapproves. Those are facts virtually unknown in the United States, or I suppose elsewhere. Uh, that suggests another conservative way to deal with the problems of the world, uh, pay attention to public opinion.
Uh, terrorism directed or supported by the most powerful states continues to the present, often in shocking ways. Uh, these facts offer another useful suggestion as to how to mitigate the plague spread by depraved opponents of civilization itself, namely stop participating in terror and stop supporting it. Uh, that would certainly contribute to the proclaimed objectives. Uh, but that suggestion, too, is off the agenda for the usual reasons. Uh, however, even with careful sanitation of discussion, uh, dilemmas constantly arise. Uh, one has just arisen in the past few weeks uh, when uh, Luis Posada Carriles entered the United States illegally. Uh, even by the narrowest definition of terror, he is clearly one of the most notorious international terrorists from the 1960s to the present. Uh, Venezuela requested that he be extradited to face charges for the bombing of a Cubana airliner in Venezuela, killing 73 people. Uh, the charges are admittedly credible, uh, but there's a real difficulty. Uh, after uh, Venezuela, after Pos uh, Posada miraculously escaped from a Venezuelan prison, uh, the liberal Boston Globe reports, he was hired by U.S. Co covered operatives to direct the resupply operation for the Nicaraguan Contras from El Salvador. That is, he was hired to play a prominent role in terrorist atrocities that are incomparably worse than blowing up the Cubana airliner. And therefore, there's a dilemma. To continue quoting the same report, uh, extraditing him for trial would send a worrisome signal to covert foreign agents that they cannot count on unconditional protection from the U.S. government, and it would expose the CIA to embarrassing public disclosures from a former operative. Well, it's clearly a difficult problem. Uh, this is just the past few weeks. Uh, the Posada dilemma was thankfully resolved by the courts, uh, which rejected Venezuela's appeal for his extradition in violation of uh, U.S.-Venezuela extradition treaty. A day later, the head of the FBI, Robert Mueller, urged Europe to speed U.S. demands for extradition. Uh, he said, we are always looking to see how we can make the extradition process go faster. We think we owe it to victims of terrorism to see to it that justice is done efficiently and effectively. Uh, at the uh, Ibero-American Summit, all Latin, heads of Latin American states and Spain, shortly after, the leaders of Spain and the Latin American countries uh, backed Venezuela's efforts to have Posada extradited from the United States to face trial for the Cubana airliner bombing. And they again condemned what they called the blockade of Cuba by the United States uh, in, they were endorsing near unanimous United Nations resolutions, uh, the most recent a few weeks ago with a vote of 179 to four. The four were United States, Israel, uh, Marshall Islands, and Palau. Uh, after strong protests from the U.S. Embassy, the summit withdrew the call for extradition, but refused to yield on the demand for an end to economic warfare. Uh, Posada is therefore now free to join his colleague, Orlando Bosch, in Miami. Uh, Bosch is implicated in dozens of terrorist crimes, including the Cubana airliner bombing, and many of these crimes on U.S. soil. Uh, the FBI and the Justice Department wanted him deported as a threat to U.S. national security, but Bush, number one, uh, took care of that by granting him a presidential pardon. Uh, notice that this goes well beyond both cases, well beyond uh, indirect encouragement of terror, uh, which is to be criminalized in Britain, uh, with consequences uh, that you can deduce. Uh, one consequence would be that every journal or publisher in England uh, is to be banned because of their praise for George Bush number one and participation with him in these and other activities. Uh, under the legislation that's proposed by New Labor and the dissenting House of Lords. Uh, one might have thought 
that a dilemma would have arisen as well when John Negroponte was appointed to the position of head of counterterrorism last year. Uh, he was the ambassador to Honduras in the 1980s, where he was running uh, the world's largest CIA station, and not because of the grand role of Honduras in world affairs, uh, but because Honduras was the primary U.S. base for the international terrorist war, which Washington was, for which Washington was condemned by the World Court and the Security Council absent the veto. Uh, Negroponte had the task of ensuring that the international terrorist operations would proceed efficiently. Uh, his responsibilities also included uh, pressuring and bribing senior Honduran generals to step up their support for the terrorist war. The most vicious of the Honduran killers and torturers was General Alvarez Martinez, who was the chief of the Honduran Armed Forces at the time. He had informed the United States that, in his words, he intended the Armed Forces at the time. He had informed the United States that, in his words, he intended to use the Argentine method of eliminating su suspected subversives. No comment necessary on that. Uh, Negroponte. Uh, regularly denied a gruesome state crimes in Honduras to ensure that military aid would continue to flow for international terrorism. Uh, knowing all about Alvarez, the Reagan administration awarded him the Legion of Merit Medal for formal words for encouraging the success of democratic processes in Honduras, which tells you something about democracy promotion. Uh, when the government of Honduras finally got around to trying to deal with these crimes and to bring the perpetrators to justice, the Reagan and Bush number one administration refused to allow Negroponte to testify as the Honduran courts had requested. Uh, coming back to the present, there was virtually no reaction to the appointment of a leading international terrorist to the top counterterrorism position in the world. Uh, nor was there any reaction to the fact that at the very same time, the heroine of the popular struggle that overthrew the vicious Somoza regime in Nicaragua, uh, Dora Maria Teles, uh, was denied a visa to teach at the Harvard Divinity School on the grounds that she was a terrorist. Uh, her crime was that she had helped overthrow a U.S.-backed tyrant and mass murderer. Uh, Orwell, I think, would not have known whether to laugh or to weep. Now, that's today. Uh, so far, I've been keeping to the kinds of topics that would be addressed in a discussion of the war on terror uh, that was not deformed in accord with the iron laws of doctrine. And this barely scratches the surface. But let's now adopt Western hypocrisy and cynicism and keep to the operative definition of terror, which is the same as the official definition, but with the Nuremberg exception. Admissible terror is your terror. Uh, ours is exempt. Uh, even with this constraint, uh, terror is a major problem, undoubtedly. And to mitigate or terminate the threat of, should be a high priority. Uh, regrettably, it is not. Uh, the invasion of Iraq is perhaps the most glaring example of the low priority assigned by U.S. and British leaders to the threat of terror. Uh, they had been advised by their own intelligence agencies and others that the invasion was likely to increase the threat of terror, and indeed it did, as the same intelligence agencies confirm. To take just one of many illustrations, uh, last May, the CIA reported that Iraq has become a magnet for Islamic militants similar to Soviet-occupied Afghanistan two, days ago, two decades ago and Bosnia in the 1990s. The CIA concluded that Iraq may prove to be an even more effective training ground for Islamic extremists than Afghanistan was in Al-Qaeda's early years because it is serving as a real-world laboratory for urban combat. Shortly after the London bombing last July, uh, Chatham House released a study concluding, in their words, there is no doubt that the invasion of Iraq 
has given a boost to the Al-Qaeda network in propaganda, recruitment, and fundraising, while providing an ideal training ground for terrorists, and leaves the UK, the United Kingdom, at particular risk because it is the closest ally of the United States and is a pillion passenger of American policy in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, riding behind the driver of the motorcycle. Uh, and in fact, uh, terrorist crimes sharply escalated in the following year, approximately tripled. Uh, well, there's extensive supporting evidence to show that, as anticipated, the invasion increased the risk of terror and nuclear proliferation. Uh, none of that shows that planners prefer these consequences, of course. Uh, rather, they're not of much concern in comparison with much higher priorities, uh, priorities that are obscure uh, only to those who prefer what uh, human rights researchers sometimes call intentional ignorance, a widely distributed plague among the educated. Uh, once again, uh, we find uh, very easily a way to reduce the threat of terror. Stop acting in ways that predictably enhance the threat. Uh, well, though enhancement of the threat of terror and proliferation uh, was anticipated in the invasion of Iraq, the invasion uh, actually did so even in unanticipated ways. It's common to say that uh, no weapons of mass destruction were found in Iraq after an exhaustive search. However, that's not quite accurate. Uh, there were stores of weapons of mass destruction uh, in Iraq, uh, namely those that were produced in the 1980s uh, thanks to aid provided by the United States and Britain, along with others. Uh, these sites had been secured by UN inspectors who were in fact dismantling the weapons but the inspectors were dismissed by the invaders and the sites were left unguarded. Uh, the inspectors nevertheless continued to carry out their work with satellite imagery. Uh, they discovered sophisticated massive looting of these installations in over 100 sites. That includes weapons, includes equipment for producing solid and liquid propellant missiles, uh, biotoxins and other materials usable for chemical and biological weapons, and also high precision equipment capable of making parts for nuclear and chemical weapons and missiles. Uh, a Jordanian journalist who was monitoring the Jordanian-Iraqi border found that after the US-UK forces took over, radioactive materials were detected in one out of every eight trucks crossing to Jordan, destination unknown, and we'd rather not guess. Uh, well, the ironies are almost inescapable, inexpressible. Uh, the official justification for the US-UK invasion was to prevent the use of weapons of mass destruction that did not exist. The invasion provided the terrorists who had been mobilized by the US and its allies with the means to develop weapons of mass destruction, namely equipment that they had provided to Saddam Hussein caring nothing about the terrible crimes that were later invoked to whip up support for the invasion. Uh, it's as if uh, Iran were now making nuclear weapons using fissionable material provided by the US uh, to Iran under the Shah, uh, which may indeed be happening. Uh, all of these would be headlines in bold face in every newspaper in a free country in the world. Uh, that's concerned with the truth of the important truths. You can judge how many times you've read it. Uh, turning to another domain, the US Treasury Department has a bureau that's assigned the task of investigating suspicious financial transfers. It's a central component of the war on terror. Uh, in April 2004, the bureau gave its regular report to Congress and it informed Congress that of its 120 employees, four were assigned to tracking the finances of Osama bin Laden and Saddam Hussein, while uh, six times that many were occupied with enforcing the embargo against Cuba. Tells you something else about priorities. This goes way back from 1990 to 2003, 
there were 93 terrorism-related investigations with $9,000 in fines and 11,000 Cuba-related investigations with $8 million in fines. The revelations, of course, received the silent treatment in the U.S. media and elsewhere as well, to my knowledge. Uh, well, why should the Treasury Department devote vastly more energy to strangling Cuba than to the war on terror? Uh, well, the basic reasons were explained in internal documents of the Kennedy-Johnson years. Uh, State Department planners warned that, in their words, the very existence of the Castro regime is successful defiance of U.S. policies going back 150 years to the Monroe Doctrine. Notice, not Russians, but intolerable defiance of the master of the hemisphere, uh, much like Iran's crime of successful defiance in 1979. Uh, punishment of the population of Cuba was regarded as fully legitimate, so we also learn from internal documents. The Eisenhower State Department uh, concluded, decided that in their words, the Cuban people are responsible for the regime, so therefore the United States has the right to cause them suf to suffer by economic strangulation, uh, later escalated to direct and very serious terror by Kennedy. Uh, Eisenhower and Kennedy agreed that the embargo would hasten Fidel Castro's departure as a result of what they called rising discomfort among hungry Cubans. And notice that all of that fits to a T, the definition of terror, quite apart from the direct terrorist acts, which were serious. Uh, and so it continued when Cuba was in dire acts, which were serious. Uh, and so it continued when Cuba was in dire straits after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, Washington intensified the punishment of the people of Cuba uh, at the initiative of liberal Democrats. The author of the 1992 resolution to tighten the blockade proclaimed that my objective is to wreak havoc in Cuba. That's uh, New Jersey liberal Democrat Robert Torricelli. And all of that continues to the present moment, putting the war on terror very deep in the shadows because it's much less important than this. Uh, if uh, reducing the threat of terror were a high priority for Washington or London, uh, there would be ways to proceed, uh, even apart from the unmentionable idea of withdrawing participation. Uh, the first step, plainly, is to try to understand its roots. Uh, with regard to Islamic terror, there's a broad consensus among intelligence agencies and researchers. They identify two categories. On the one hand are the jihadis, organized by the U.S. and its allies in the 1980s, uh, they regard themselves as a vanguard, it's one category. The other category is their audience, which may reject terror, but nevertheless regard the cause of the jihadis as just. So a serious counter-terror campaign uh, would therefore begin by considering the grievances and, where appropriate, uh, addressing them, as should be done with or without the threat of terror. Some experience in Ireland about this. Uh, there's broad agreement uh, among specialists that Al-Qaeda-style terror, I'm quoting, is today less a product of Islamic fundamentalism than a simple strategic goal to compel the United States and its Western allies to withdraw combat forces from the Arabian Peninsula and other Muslim countries. That's Robert Pape, who's the academic uh, scholar who's done the major uh, studies of uh, suicide bombers. Uh, serious analysts have pointed out that bin Laden's words and deeds correlate closely, and history reveals the same. The jihadis who were organized by the Reagan administration and its allies uh, ended their Afghan-based terror inside Russia uh, after the Russians withdrew from Afghanistan, though they continue it from uh, occupied Muslim Chechnya, which is the scene of uh, horrifying Russian crimes back to the 19th century. Uh, Osama himself turned against the United States in 1991 because he took it to be occupying the holiest Arab land. Now, that was later acknowledged by the Pentagon. Uh, 
as a reason for shifting U.S. bases from Saudi Arabia to Iraq. Uh, additionally, uh, uh, Osama was angered by the rejection of his offer to join the attack against Saddam. Uh, the most uh, extensive scholarly inquiry into the jihadi phenomenon by the American scholar Fawaz Girgis uh, concludes that after 9-11, I'm quoting him, the dominant response to al-Qaeda in the Muslim world was very hostile, uh, specifically among the jihadis, who regarded it as an extremely dangerous extremist fringe. Uh, instead of recognizing that opposition to al-Qaeda, uh, instead of recognizing that the, the existence of the opposition and the fact that it offered Washington the most effective way to drive a nail into its coffin, by finding intelligent means to nourish and support the internal forces that were opposed to militant ideologies like the bin Laden network, uh, the Bush administration did exactly what bin Laden hoped it would do, resort to violence, uh, particularly in the invasion of Iraq. Uh, investigations by Israeli and uh, Saudi intelligence, which are supported by U.S. strategic studies institutes, conclude that foreign fighters in Iraq, which are maybe 5 to 10 percent of the insurgents, were mobilized by the invasion and furthermore had no previous record of association with terrorist groups. Uh, the achievements of the Bush administration planners and its pillion rider, uh, their achievements in inspiring Islamic radicalism and terror and in joining Osama in creating a clash of civilizations are quite impressive. Uh, the uh, senior CIA analyst responsible for tracking Osama bin Laden from 1996, Michael Scheuer, writes that U.S. forces and policies are completing the radicalization of the Islamic world, something Osama bin Laden has been trying to do with substantial but incomplete success since the early 1990s. As a result, Scheuer adds, it is fair to conclude that the United States of America remains bin Laden's only indispensable ally. Uh, the grievances that the jihadis appeal to as a mobilizing technique, those are very real. Uh, a Pentagon Advisory Board panel just a few months ago concluded a, uh, that uh, Muslims do not hate our freedom, but rather they hate our policies. Uh, and they added that when American public diplomacy talks about bringing democracy to Islamic societies, uh, this is seen as no more than self-serving hypocrisy. Uh, those conclusions go back many years. Uh, if we choose not to know them, it's because of intentional ignorance in public for a long time. Uh, the uh, Eisenhower, President Eisenhower in 1958 puzzled about what he called the campaign of hatred against us in the Arab world, not by the governments, but by the people who are on Nasser's side, uh, supporting independent secular nationalism, which the U.S. opposed. It was supporting fundamentalist extremism. Uh, the reason for the campaign of hatred uh, was explained by the National Security Council, the highest planning organization. Uh, here are their words. In the eyes of the majority of Arabs, the United States appears to be opposed to the realization of the goals of Arab nationalism. They believe that the United States is seeking to protect its interest in Near East oil by supporting the status quo and opposing political or economic progress. Uh, furthermore, they say, the perception is understandable. Our economic and cultural interests in the area have led, not unnaturally, to close U.S. relations with elements in the Arab world whose primary interest lies in the maintenance of relations with the West and the status quo in their countries, uh, blocking democracy and development. Uh, they didn't go on to point out that this is the most extreme fundamentalist fanatics in the world and also some of the most brutal and vicious regimes. That's 1958. Uh, Right after 9-11, the Wall Street Journal uh, carried out a survey of the opinions of what they called moneyed Muslims. That's immediately after 
uh, they surveyed the bankers, professionals, uh, businessmen, uh, all committed to official so-called Western values and embedded in the neoliberal globalization project. Uh, they too were dismayed by Washington's support for harsh authoritarian states and the barriers Washington erects against development and democracy by propping up oppressive regimes. That goes on to the present moment. Uh, they, however, had new grievances beyond those reported by the National Security Council in 1958, uh, primarily Washington's sanctions regime in Iraq, U.S.-British sanctions regime, uh, and support for, uh, uh, didn't mean much in the West, but uh, slaughtering hundreds of thousands of people, uh, devastating the society, strengthening Saddam, probably preventing him from being overthrown. Now, that actually meant something among the backward people of the Arab world. Uh, that was one. And the other was support for uh, Israel's military occupation and takeover of the occupied territories. Uh, there was no survey carried out of the great mass of poor and suffering people, but it's likely that their sentiments are more intense, uh, coupled with bitter resentment of the Western-oriented elites and the corrupt and brutal rulers backed by Western power, who ensure that the enormous wealth of the region flows to the West, apart from enriching themselves. And the Iraq invasion only intensified these feelings further, uh, much as anticipated, also contributing materially to the increase in the threat and reality of nuclear proliferation and uh, international terrorism. Uh, well, there are ways to deal constructively with the threat of terror, uh, though not preferred by bin Laden's indispensable ally, uh, or by those who want to avoid the real world by uh, striking heroic poses about Islamo-fascism, or those who simply claim that uh, no proposal has been made when there are quite straightforward proposals that they do not like. The constructive ways begin uh, with an honest look in the mirror, uh, never an easy task, uh, always a necessary one. <laughs>